Recently, the Society for Vascular Surgery decided to put together a video archive documenting the background of our society and specialty, uh, interviewing a number of the leaders and innovators in the field. And today we have uh, Dr. William Baker with us, who uh, was born and raised in Chicago and spent most of his career at Loyola. Welcome, Bill. Uh, thank you. Nice to be here. You came to medicine very honestly. Both your parents were physicians. That is correct. My father is a urologist. Uh, he did most of his work at the old St. Luke's Hospital before it became uh, a Press St. Luke's, where it is present location. And he was also at the county and a, uh, and a clinical professor at Northwestern. My mother uh, actually had an MD PhD. Uh, they were in the same class at the old Rush Medical School. I think it was 1925, but I don't hold me to that one. And she uh, was an obstetrician uh, gynecologist. Uh, she did most of her training actually in general surgery and some of it the Mayo Brothers, but eased into women's medicine because that's what women did. And she practiced for a long time, didn't she? Until she was about 75. I see, all right. <laughs> that's good. And then was, was your dad the chief of urology at county? Yes. Uh, for but that, he, as he would say, that, that's the damning of faint praise. He was in both World War I and World War II, and by the time you add up those points on a civil service examination, there was no way anybody else was going to be chief. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And then the, one of your kids is a physician, too. Yes. My oldest daughter. Uh, I call her Elizabeth, the rest of the world calls her Beth, is at your institution as an internist. She's done pretty well. She's uh, won some awards and uh, she's, uh, she has a master's in medical education and uh, now is pursuing a PhD. I see. Oh yeah, she's a good friend of mine. I know her well. Um, the, uh, I mean, it's not surprising that you came back to Chicago. Your, all your, your education was here. and. Well, I hopscotched around the country. I, uh, my medical school was here, and my internship was here at the University of Chicago. Then I went to Iowa for a year for a residency, and at that time I was aimed to be a urologist like my father. I see. And then I um, was privileged to go into the armed forces, the Army. In the first year, I defended Seattle very successfully. Nobody, nobody endangered the entire city while I was there. Now, what year was that, just to give us? Ooh, 1963-64. I see, so the Vietnam War was just ramping up. Yes, and the next year, I got, was awarded one of the McNamara Traveling Fellowships, which loosely translated means I went to Vietnam. Oh, yeah. And we went over there by troop ship. It looked like a bad scene out of a grade B John Wayne movie. We went over the side of the ship once we got there, went in through Landy Craft, plopped down on the beach, and there we were. And the next wave brought on Connexes. And somebody said, well, that's your hospital in there. Fortunately, we had some very good enlisted men who knew how to actually put up tents. And we went out in the valley and we started a hospital. And then, so you had done a year of internship at that point, or? You, I'd done you one had, year of internship, so you, you one year of residency, okay. and I'd spent one year uh, in a very uh, protected environment in, in the Army in Seattle. I've, we would do one gallbladder and one hemorrhoid or something every morning. So you basically were drafted before you finished your residency? Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I was 3150, was that uh, D, I think, having, that's a surgeon having had at least one year of training. Gotcha. And then, so where were you, where did you spend most of your time? You were there for about, what, for a year? Uh, it counted as a year because it was 10 months and two days. <clears throat> Each of those days was in different months. <laughs> so that, that's 12 months. That, yeah, that's 12 months. <laughs> and spent in beautiful Koinyan, uh -huh. which uh, is the garden spot of Binden province. It's a few hundred miles north of Saigon on the South China Sea. And, and I've been, people who have been back say it's really a very nice city. Uh, one, one of my colleagues that went back couldn't even find the, where the old hospital was. But we had a great group. Nobody volunteered. Absolutely nobody. As far as I know, everybody wrote their congressman with a sad story. But the Army being the Army, 
appointed a chief of the hospital who was married with seven children. So we didn't stand a chance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, was in with some great people. You know uh, uh, Jim Madura uh, from Indiana and uh, Bob Filler, uh, Al Divins, and others. Uh, one of them, the ophthalmologist, is the secretary of the international ophthalmologist. The orthopedic surgeon was world class. Our, uh, our internist was, I think, a founding member of the board of, the, of, uh, of nuclear medicine. And uh, while he was there, they figured out that how to treat uh, some resistant malaria. Really had great people. Uh, th that made the, the whole year. I learned a lot. Did you do any vascular surgery? Well, I remember some, yeah. but you have to remember at my stage, I was always paired with somebody who was fully trained. Right. And so I can remember trying to fix a young man's uh, popliteal who had been shot. He was 20, and he had a huge atherosclerotic plaque in his popliteal. Oh boy. Yeah. I remember another time we fixed a, a couple of carotids. Uh, one was a, uh, a ward officer who walked in front of his helicopter and the static electricity made a rocket go off. And as the rocket went by, it just slashed his, his throat. And as the rocket went by, it just cauterized everything. And somehow he lived and got transferred down to us. I see. So we fixed him. Uh, he eventually succumbed to this complications of that. I remember another time, another carotid, I was working with Bob Filler and he looked over and the ether screen and asked the anesthesiologist, uh, is that tube, that uh, IV thing sterile? I said, yes. Yeah. Could you give it to me? And we use that for a shunt. <laughs> I see. <Okay. laughs> we didn't have perfect equipment when we got there. I yeah. think that's an understatement. Right, right. Norm Rich was over there at the same time. Norm was 50 miles up the road. He probably didn't know who he was at the time. No, uh, I think he stayed with us one night, but you know, we, he might as well have been in a different co country. I mean, we were, you didn't hitchhike up the road in Vietnam. You stayed in your little spot and made sure that everybody around you looked friendly and you did not go out in the boondocks. So after that, you went back to a uh, residency. Went back to a residency and all those medical students that I yelled at as a as a uh, intern were now above me, <laughs> uh, and actually worked out very well. Uh, but what was uh, what was interesting was that the faculty had had a turnover in this time at the U of C. At the U of C, there'd been four years and all new people. Uh, so I got to benefit from new ideas, new mentorship, and in. Some of them, like George Block and Ferguson, uh, are just indelled in my mind for, for a variety of reasons. And then along the way, you got the idea that you would uh, do vascular surgery and uh, look for a fellowship. I think it's my fourth year. I've rotated on cardiovascular, and that's where the vascular surgery was done at that time. And our results were less than perfect. And I could read in the medical journals that other people were getting better results. And another resident and I were, you know, mulled this over and I, he went off into thoracic surgery and I decided to investigate uh, vascular. And at that time, Paul Stewart came on the, uh, the faculty and he was, uh, uh, he's a transplant surgeon. He, uh, he had done his general surgery in San Francisco and he'd done his uh, fellowship in transplant in Boston. And in talking with him, he said, don't go to Boston. He says, they're just not up to San Francisco. I've seen them both. And so, in my trek, looking for fellowships, uh, I, went, I went west. And so there, there you were in San Francisco at the University of California with Jack Wiley and company. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, Jack was a unique character. Of course, at the time, I didn't call him Jack. It was always Dr. Wiley. I doubt that I said, sir, that just isn't my, my nature. Even but, with your military background. Yeah, well, I'm, I was not exactly strack, as they say in the military. But Jack was a wonderful person in that, if you, you wouldn't challenge him, but if, let's say it's after an operation, or, and you'd say, uh, Dr. Wiley, 
Last week we had a case in which we did thus and so, and today we had one that looks a lot similar, but you did something different. You go, <coughs> Baker, you didn't notice. <coughs> or uh, one time I came from a conference that I, he invited me to and at another hospital, and uh, same scenario. I said, Dr. Wiley, last week at UCSF you told us that this is what you always do, and then you went to this conference, and I didn't see much difference. You said do the opposite. <coughs> Baker, did you see that guy in the loud sports shirt in the front row? <coughs> Train killer. You couldn't tell him to do that. <coughs> <laughs> but I mean, he was, he was just more fun than a barrel of monkeys, but very honest, and I learned a lot about vascular <coughs> surgery just from being uh, kind of obnoxious, as I usually am, but asking questions. Uh, Stoney and Ehrenfeld were there, and they were they were exact opposites. Aaron Fell was from New York City, calm, spoke with his New York accent. Uh, Friday afternoons, he, you knew he wasn't going to be there. He was going to play tennis with Gomez. I don't know who Gomez was, but I know that's who they played tennis with. And Stoney, on the other hand, would get so excited. He, he loved a tough case, and he didn't swear, as far as I know. He didn't throw instruments. He didn't hit people. But he'd have the stony stomp, and he'd just stomp his foot down. Everybody knew he was really upset. Yeah. <laughs> but, but they were both good doctors, very good doctors. Did they, what was the format of the fellowship? Did, they, did you do cases, or did you watch cases, or how did that all go? Uh, you have to have a flashback to 1969-70, uh, in which I did a lot of scrubbing and not a lot of doing. I scrubbed on two cases a day and sometimes three, like clockwork. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, don't, I didn't do between, but between five and ten as a surgeon during the entire year. Uh, sometimes the general surgeons would feel sorry for me and I get to do put an anastomosis or something. I knew about how to operate. I, when I was in Vietnam I was alone, I didn't, I don't know, probably 500 operations. I wasn't, I wasn't worried about my technical skill, and it was just great for honing your approach to problems and how to, uh, how to escape trouble. Dr. Wiley is one of the people that started thinking about having special training for vascular surgery. I don't know how it originally came about, but Mac Perry was his first, and I think that uh, Tom Shires uh, recognized that there was a better way to do things, and that Jack Wiley was doing them better. And so somehow Mac found himself in San Francisco doing an ad hoc fellowship in vascular surgery. There were a number of people in between Mac and, uh, and yours truly, and uh, as I say, I was there in 1969-70. And Jack believed that vascular surgery should be done by vascular surgeons because he got better results. And I don't think there's much doubt about that. Did he have an opinion about a separate board for vascular surgery? or? defining it separately from general surgery? At this point, I believe Jack uh, wanted to make sure that, that surgeons were trained in vascular surgery. And he felt that a fellowship was the best way to distribute vascular surgeons in other training programs. I don't know that he he felt strongly about a separate board, but he understood that there was a specialty of vascular surgery. Mm -hmm. Whether it was a separate board or an allied board, I, I really never did hear him say much about that. But it's clear if you read what he wrote that that was in his mind to somehow make, those, make us special and, put, and make us distinct from general surgery. Dr. Bergen told me that he was a good sailor. I wonder if he ever took you out. He did. Yeah. Uh, I went out once with him in a boat. Uh, he was known as a fearless sailor. I think <laughs> that's a... So when you raced against Jack, if he had a half a foot lead on you, he would nose into you. And we went up the Raccoon Straits the one time I was there, and that's between Belvedere Island and uh, Angel Island, uh, Marin County. And uh, I'm at the helm. Have I ever sailed before? No, but that didn't stop me. And so I'm sitting there, and uh, Dr. Wiley, time to come about. And oh, not yet, Baker. And of course, Angel Island at this point is a sheer cliff. Yeah. 
Now he knew it went straight down. I had no idea whether there was Where the a, bottom was. Or, I had no idea. But he knew San Francisco Bay like the back of his hand. <coughs> Dr. Wiley, uh, now? <coughs> Hold on, Baker, not yet. <coughs> and finally, I, I was sure we were climbing the, the, the face of, of this sheer cliff before. <coughs> Uh, Baker, it's about, about time now, you know, that uh -huh. he enjoyed, uh, <laughs> he enjoyed things like that. And of course, I had fun at the same time. That's good. <laughs> All right, so then uh, a move to Iowa. Well, Iowa was very interesting. Uh, I went back to Iowa under, uh, uh, as I say, interesting circumstances. I'd spent a year there in uh, general surgery, uh, even though I was in urology, and I'd had a wonderful year because for a couple of reasons. So one is, even though I was a urology, I was a urology resident, so general surgery tolerated me. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I, I had come from the University of Chicago, and I, a mecca, and I was going out to the farmland, and so my attitude was unbelievably bad, and I had a wonderful time on, regardless. And I, I did a lot of stuff, had a good time. So when I, when I went back, uh, Sidney Ziffern hired me against the wishes of the uh, Division of Cardiovascular Surgery, Hans Ehrenhoft, and Hans had to put up with me. So, uh, so when I got there, I got there the 1st of September, and I think by the 1st of, first of January, I may have done a dozen cases. But they just didn't let me do anything. Uh, so I you know, busied myself doing a few, few hundred other things, and after that, things took off, though. Uh, I, that co uh, coincided with Dr. Condon coming. Mm -hmm. He was hired in September. He didn't show up until January, and he just told Hans, he says, look, if he doesn't work, I'm holding you responsible. And so I got, you know, uh, I wasn't shut out anymore. And then uh, uh, Bob Barnes uh, was there. Bob was a, was a wonderful human being. Uh, he was hired uh, by Dr. Condon, although Condon had come to Iowa from the University of Illinois. His training was really in Seattle, and Bob's training was in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And he uh, uh, convinced Bob to come, and uh, Bob brought a whole s other set of expertise. He had been trained by Gene Stranis and had uh, new uh, non-invasive testing inside and out. He'd spent time at uh, the NIH. Uh, doing uh, research, whereas I was in Vietnam having a great time training my fingers, he was training his brain, mm -hmm. uh, which is not a bad thing to do. <laughs> and so we, we got along famously. Uh, uh, it, w it was a very, very good combination. And then right along, uh, at some point, probably from Dr. Wiley, you got interested in carotids. And that, that's, you've devoted a certain segment of your career to the carotid operation. Well, Dr. Wiley was wonderful. He, when he did a carotid, uh, he tried to use a shunt based on whatever he was, whatever uh, criteria he had at the time. And if things were going well, he did the carotid endarterectomy, and then uh, he most of the time he didn't use the shunt. Then he, of course, you'd love this. Uh, he he'd have Myliota, the scrub nurse, take down his his uh, mask. And then he'd have to put on his glasses. The reason he took down the mask was his glasses would fog up. And then he'd close the carotid deal with it, just breathing back and forth. <laughs> I remember one time we had some uh, Japanese dignitaries in the back row of the operating room. And I remember hearing of when they saw Wiley Soane with, with no mask and the glasses. Ah, so, you know, just. <laughs> <laughs> they learned something. Oh, new <laughs> secrets. Of, and every once in a while he put the shunt in. And things, you know, the shunt gets in your way. I don't care who you are. I mean, some days it works well, and some days it's just an aggravation. Mm -hmm. You can overcome it, but it's an aggravation. He wouldn't overcome it. Pretty soon there'd be clamps on, the shunt would be on the floor, and then he'd finish the operation. And I figured out early that his criteria were, were not based in exact science. <laughs> and so when I started doing carotids, I decided we wouldn't use a shunt on anybody, and we would record data, and we'd see if a, if a certain subset of patients really needed a shunt, or whether this was a bunch of overkill. Mm -hmm. And that's how my career in carotids got started. No, no more complicated than that.
So for a few years, you didn't use Shenzhen for anybody. Yeah. Yeah. And, Not a soul. Uh, yeah, and uh, and published on that too. And then, oh yes. And then at some point, uh, you begin to identify a subgroup that possibly could use a shunt. Well, as the statisticians will tell you, if you have small numbers, there are things that you can hide with small numbers. Uh -huh. And as you get more and more and more, then that group with the low stump pressures uh, started showing up with more and more uh, strokes. And so when it became obvious that. that that group needed a shunt, then we would use shunts in those patients. I, that's, that's how you learn. Were you, were you basing it on stump pressures? Yes. I see. And we did not do EEGs at the time. It was long before potentials, and it was long before oxygen measurements. It was, uh, we just used stump pressures. And they're pretty accurate. And logical. Yeah, and Dr. Ehrenfeld had used them in San Francisco in a different set. He would get a back pressure in patients who had dissections of their carotid, and if it was high, then he knew that he could tie off that carotid. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. Uh, very, uh, so that, all of that kind of melds together. So in Iowa, among other things, you became interested in the non-invasive lab. Uh, you learned probably from Bob about a lot about that and then carried that with you and then at some point uh, you were recruited to come back to Chicago. Well I did learn about the non-invasive lab from Bob Barnes and just mm -hmm. being a around what he did mm -hmm. and I'm, I remember all the people that were there uh, uh, doing the non-invasive testing and one of them of course I recruited to come with me and when I came back to Chicago uh, at Loyola uh, I, I uh, I brought back Andy Hayes to run the PV lab because although I'm clearly well versed in everything, Andy knew a lot more than I did about the lab. Mm -hmm. Like it or not, it's interesting. I saw him just this last weekend. He's still alive and well. And then at that point, uh, Dr. Freark was at Loyola. Uh, Dr. Freark was the chief at Loyola. Uh, uh, Jack Pickleman was there, and uh, Herb Greenley was the head of the, of the VA. Uh, Ployan, who was at the University of Chicago, and his training when I was there is now doing endocrine out there, and we had a very nice group, uh, among others. And Free Arc wrote me, a, came to visit uh, a couple of times. Came, came, to, came to Iowa? No, oh, no, I, I came here, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I see you. Uh, and then I... Uh, uh, I got this letter from him. It said, uh, Dear Bill, I've just spent all night in the operating room with some vascular horrific. We need he, you. <laughs> he says, My patients, my wife, and the Humane Society wish you would take this job. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he is a wonderful person. Yeah, yeah. Very relaxed. Uh, his idea of a uh, executive committee meeting was to open his door and yell out to, to Dr. Pickle and myself, Jack, Bill, come here! That was an executive committee meeting. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, slightly different than today. And then, so you moved to Loyola, and you had some, over the years, some very talented people in your division. Um, Fred, Le you were able to recruit Fred Latouille. Well, I started a fellowship at, at Iowa, uh, and uh, uh, I, I, the race started, I got a call one time from Dr. Wiley, he says, Baker, do you have a fellowship? I said, uh, no, sir, he says, get one. <laughs> and that's when Doug Dorner came at Iowa. I got another call from Wiley, Baker, do you need help? And I said, well, I think we could probably stand some. He says, I'm good. And he told me about Fred Latouille, and Fred had, uh, as I recall the story, was scheduled to go in the Army, and the Army called up and said, sorry, we don't need you. And I think they called him in April uh -huh. for, you know, in case yeah. you have, don't have anything to do in July. Uh -huh. uh, the Fred recruitment is wonderful. He came to see us, and, and uh, Freark made him stay at his house because Freark's too lazy to go out to the hotel and pick him up. And they went out running the next morning, and Fred says, God, I can hardly keep up with this guy. What's wrong? And Fred went through the day, and uh, then he got on a plane and went to Cleveland to interview. It just felt terrible. 
didn't even get off the plane, or he got off the plane, but didn't get out of the airport, turned around, went back to San Francisco. Well, it turned out that he was, you know, Fred's long and tall, cramped in the cheap seats. He got a, he got a DVT, and he had a small pulmonary embolism. Oh, boy. He never had another one. Yeah. It did fine. But at any rate, that's why he came to Loyola. He didn't interview any place else. <laughs> Isn't that something? Boy, oh, boy. So anyway, Fred was there, and Fred uh, is a very good doctor, and he had the patience of Job. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's wonderful. And then we had Phil Dobrin, who, who was there when I came, and Phil is a world-class physiologist. He had the unique ability to take a problem, study it, study it, and study it, and after a while, there was a single variable in his experiment. They were so elegant in their simplicity, no matter what he was doing. And he was world-class enough so that Nobel Prize winners would call him with questions. Uh, very interesting. We had Howard Greisler. Uh, Howard uh, is well-known to everybody, and, and, and he ran uh, the basic science uh, part of our outfit, was, gave us the, a very valuable third leg to our stools. Nikos came for a while. Mm -hmm. Carolyn Semro worked for Kendall, and she somehow worked with us. I don't remember how that started. She was a friend of Nicolaides, and then I got to know Dr. Nicolaides, and then Nicolaides obviously knows Dr. Labrapoulos. And, you know, they're all... And Nikos worked with uh, Nicolaides. Yes. Yeah, I'm sure he did, yeah. And so somehow Nikos fell into our lap, uh -huh. and. Uh, had more good times with him and Fred. You go to conference, and I'd start. I'd ask a question to some unsuspecting resident someplace, mm -hmm. and Fred would start laughing because he knew the next three questions were going to get this guy in a hole he couldn't get out of. And Nikos would start, and he and he's, uh, he and I would challenge each other in the literature, and we had more fun. It was just a great intellectual time. And Walt obviously knows this. Chicago, I think, is unique in that we have all these medical schools and all these vascular groups. And there was a very, we're all in competition, but there was no competition. You're over there, I'm over here, and, and we got along very well. I Geographically, it works out perfectly. Everyone it has does. their territory, and so we're all yeah. friends. It's, yeah. yeah. That's in contradistinction to some of our colleagues who seem to have more animosity in their in their heart than we do. Right, right. I know it's, it's, a, it's a great place to practice. Now, at Loyola, you were the pro, you work with general surgery and you were in charge of the residency or you work with the residents as well as running your own training program. So you know a lot about resident training. That's, you, you've been, you did that for years and years. Oh, yeah, I don't know that I know a lot about how to train a resident, but I know a lot about how shuffling papers and assigning people and we do, uh, some of the fun things that program directors get to do because some guy drops out and has got to find somebody else to take their spot. Somebody in the faculty says, how come you assigned him to me? I can't stand that. And on it goes. And so uh -huh. how do you balance all that is all, every program director will tell you about fun. But if you consider when you have six general surgery residents, almost every time, even the number six guy on there is going to go out and be a good surgeon. Sometimes you get one that you think can be a, a world-class surgeon. And then we go into that dilemma, well, he should go into academia. Why? Why shouldn't he go down to the hospital down here and upgrade them and be the best doctor they've ever seen? And so it's, it's fun training these guys. Some of the papers that you'll read about, well, we need to rank them all and we need to have a way to rank number one through six. They're all good guys. Who cares who's number one? Now, you want to care if somebody is not, is not carrying his weight, isn't going to be a good person. That we have to identify, and it's easy. It'd be nice to identify them earlier, not later. But they're all good people. And then as you're, toward the end of your uh, career as a, a program director, the 80-hour work week came along, and I was remembering your presidential address at the Central Surgical where you addressed that uh, in a famous paper entitled, We Have Meant the Enemy and They Are Us. <laughs> and I, no, I just wondered what your thoughts were about the 80-hour work week and the 
pros and cons of that sort of self-legislation that we've got? Well, it's like talking about the graduated income tax. <laughs> it's here. Yeah. I mean, don't fight it. It's like going outside and saying, gosh, I don't like hot weather. Well, today it happens to be 90 out. I, you better adapt. And I, I think the gist of the talk was that we need to adapt. We surgeons need to adapt because society demands this. And I don't even know if it's 80 anymore. For all I know, it's 60 or 40. But it doesn't make any difference what it is. It's out of our hands. We need to adapt. And we have to make sure that we train good surgeons within this framework. And I know you know that we, we take, most programs take interns and they go through a, an apprenticeship and how to order tests and uh, say yes sir and show up and click their heels. That's not what a surgical training program is about. We need to get them involved today, now. So shorten things, but we can still get them out, but we're so hung up, and you can understand why, hung up on providing service for our patients and the hospital is not ready to hire one more new body so we can streamline our training program. So it's really very difficult. But we need to adapt, that is correct. Every time I would go to by somebody's office and you'd see the three residents and four students out there waiting while the attending man was on the phone. Well, if you're gonna have a 40 hour week week, work week, you can't afford to have too many 15 or 30 minute periods where you're just, you know, hmm, I don't think I'll wait for the chief. And we, we have to adapt. Tell us a little bit about the history of the independent board and how that all, that, that uh, trans, the beginning of that transpired as you were ascending the leadership ranks in vascular surgery. One of the nice things about being involved with the vascular societies is that uh, you do meet all these different people and whether you're on the program committee or whether you're on local arrangements or whether you're on this committee or that, you start to, be, to know all these different people. And at, the, and at the time of where there was this fomenting about whether we should be se separate, let's give full credit to Drs. Aviath and Stanley who when they, when they went through their presidential addresses, just laid it out for everybody to listen to, and they said, look, we want to be separate. Well, we're, not, we're being treated as uh, a ugly stepsister, so to speak, and we don't think that's correct either for us or for our patients. Uh, uh, I can remember a noted um, general-vascular surgeon who was in the audience who was appalled because he had never heard any of this, this uh, talk. But if you, if you read the, bull, the little pamphlet they put out for examinees, it would say that yes, basically it would say yes, there's a special examination in vascular surgery, but you really don't need it. It's all covered in general surgery, and you can do just as good a job. And that's the kind of an attitude that, that, that made most of us uh, uh, rebel against uh, general surgery at that point. I remember uh, a uh, member of the board of uh, American Board of Surgery saying, well, what, what are you guys going to do if, if we just tell you no? And I said, well, you're not a very good student of history. So you don't remember Dr. Wiley and his friends when they said we need to evaluate training programs and they just set up the peak committee to evaluate training programs, you guys weren't even involved. I said, it'll happen again, and we might even give our own exams. And I think that went back to the board, quite frankly. And it would have happened. But as you, as you take a look, what we were rebelling against is we didn't have control of our training, and that we, first of all, we, we weren't even considered, they didn't even, we were not even needed, and we didn't need control of the training since we weren't needed. So the first thing they did was they put in their bulletin and uh, in all the rest of their literature was that we, that vascular surgery was separate and distinct and was added qualifications. Right. And, and so that's, uh, uh, that separated us off. Then they gave us a, a seat on the, the, uh, the board and they gave us a seat on the residency review committee. 
And then finally there's a subboard and it evolves so that we have a de facto board. We are not independent. We are still wedded to them. And some of us think that that's uh, a political advantage. If cardiology or radiology or somology decides that, that their catheter skills are better than ours, and we need to have a strong big brother right beside us. And so I think it, it's to our advantage currently to, to partner with them because we have everything we want. It's just we don't have our separate name. And my ego can stand that. Throughout your career with the Karata, do you evolve the operation that you do? And then uh, I think it would be interesting if you would tell us how your, uh, what your technique was uh, as it was the most fine-tuned when you were last doing them. Well, Dr. McCarthy, no, you know that I have not violated a neck for approximately a decade. Oh, yeah. So what you're going to get now is my recollection of what I did. Uh, we used to use transverse incisions for no better reason than it, it was cosmetic. Most older people have transverse lines in their neck. They don't have lines that go like this, and so you'd hide the incision. No, that, that's just well, the way we did it. Others obviously like an up and down because it gives them more leeway to, to go up and down, but if you really look at the neck, all you gotta do is extend the transverse incision and it pulls up and down. That's true. Yes. Uh, most ear, nose, and throat doctors know that from doing a variety of procedures. Uh, you then dissect everything out, and one of, the, uh, one of the dicta was that you dissect the patient away from the carotid. Uh, those pickups are very fine and they're very nice, but they're not for picking up the carotid artery. The carotid artery, if you're operating on somebody f with emboli, is full of potential emboli. And you just don't need to to do that. You watch out for the nerves, get everything set up, and we would then use clamps, and I don't care what clamps you use, whether it's a, we used to use a DeBakey clamp on the common carotid and across the external carotid and some kind of a uh, curved small clamp on the internal carotid. And then once the clamps are on, we would finish the carotid dissection laterally so that the carotid artery would then rotate up into the wound. Uh, I never did do uh, eversion endarterectomies, although I have no aversion to inversion endarterectomies. Uh, I, just, uh, I just never got into it. Uh, make an incision so that you could take out the plaque. Uh, and of course, as you well know, the, the most important part of the plaque is the distal end. And you have to make sure you get it all out. You have to make, you, we would irrigate with a lots of Heparinized saline to make sure we didn't have any flaps, and if so, tack them down. Then we ended up closing with a patch. And I think I've used every patch imaginable, but I don't. I don't know that it makes any difference. Uh, you know, people would get upset about using the saphenous vein, whether it be from the from the groin or from the uh, from the ankle. And we used to use the external jugular vein a lot. Why? Because it was there. And I don't recall any any blowouts except we did have some lady that had rampant hypertension for 24 hours after the procedure in an ICU trying to control it. She managed to bleed and blow it out. Yeah. Some people used a double layer of the external carotid, yes. the external jugular. Yes. Yeah. That makes you feel better? Fine. Yeah. And then um, did you measure stump pressures before you clamped? Or yes. Or? Always measure stump pressures. And, uh, and, uh, of course, all you have to do is to uh, put the needle into the carotid, and then you, with, and you clamp the external and the common, and you get a stump pressure. Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's boilerplate, so to speak. And if you ever used a shunt, what type would you like to use? Well, we always used to use the Javid shunt. Give your institution a, a plug. Uh, why? Because we started and. I saw no reason to change. <laughs> uh, did we use any balloon shunts? Rarely. Uh, balloons are good news, bad news. They're, if, when they work correctly, they're just wonderful. And of course, they can be it blow out just a little bit more eccentric uh, rather than just than, uh, than 
than uh, be circumferential. And uh, most of the time, when, you, when we would use a balloon shunt, it's when we could not get distal control. Yeah. Up, Redo. Up, up very high. Yeah. yeah. Something right. like that. Yeah, they're good to have in, in yeah. hand, at hand occasionally. And then, uh, how much heparin did you use? I got to think about that. I think we used two or three thousand, just a pittance. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, I hated bleeding. Yeah. <laughs> you know, most of these operations take a, about a half hour. I, I know that there was a, Doug Whitney in Atlanta, his average time was 10 minutes, but uh, it's clear he wasn't longer. running a training program. <laughs> uh, our average clamp time was around 30 minutes, and uh, you, every, nothing would clamp in 30, or clot in 30 minutes. We do just fine. Yeah. Tell us about uh, some of your hobbies and uh, your uh, Alfa Romeo and so forth. Above and beyond uh, surgical, your surgical time spent. All right. Well, going through the toys, I'm, I did have a TR4 in uh, uh, in Iowa, and I think my wife set an indoor record by putting seven kids inside one time when it was raining, <laughs> and taking them to school. And in the in the winter, I have to load it up with uh, with water softener salt so it could make it up and down the hills of Iowa City. And my middle daughter did not negotiate a corner one time with it. And it was the awkward age where it was too old to get fixed and wasn't old enough to be valuable. So after that, I got Alfa Romeos. Uh, I'm now on my third one. Are you? The first one died of terminal rust. The second one just died. Actually, it didn't. I, it just got so old and crummy, uh, I traded in. The one I have now, it's a 91. My wife doesn't like it because obviously the air conditioner is not perfect. <clears throat> the windows sometimes don't go up and down, and, but I like it. So, so I'm still in my perpetual second childhood with cars. I like to play golf, and during my, our active practice, Dr. Latouille and I would, uh, would disappear on Wednesdays and we would play golf. He's a very good golfer, golfer I understand. A lot better than yours truly, particularly when he was in his prime. Uh, and so, uh, I know Dr. Town marveled at, how can you do that? And it's, the answer is, you do do it. The world knows that you're not there and they quit asking for you. Uh, same thing on Thursday, we used to play tennis with uh, Dr. Pickleman. And the residents will say, there is no bleeding so brisk, <laughs> no bowels so locked that you need to call Jack between seven and nine on Thursday night. I'd like to ride a bicycle, and I started that more when I retired because you can have some time. And I've gone to my farm in middle middle of Illinois and back, so it, I, and today I could go out and do 40 miles and wouldn't wouldn't bother me. And I, what I really like is my grandchildren. Beth has two. Uh, Christy has two. Uh, Jennifer doesn't have any, and they all live in Oak Park where I live. And so oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So that we go to more soccer games and volleyball games. And, you know, fortunately, I only have to go to one piano recital. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. And do on you, it goes. Do you do a lot of farming? I don't do any farming. When I, uh, when I grew up, I grew up in the south side of Chicago, University of Chicago neighborhood. But every summer we used to go on a farm, and I've learned which end of the pitchfork you're supposed to hold and which end of a scoop shovel you're supposed to hold and I know how to put my hands in and grab the eggs and get pecked very little and I can hand milk a cow and hold I've held pigs while they're uh, getting uh, they're getting castrated and vaccinated I've, I've done all that stuff but I do not farm now no I go down and look around and say oh you're doing a good job supervise yes I'm great at supervising yeah. Do you want to talk about some of the highlights of your career? Well, my entire career has been a highlight. I will tell you I've had more fun at each stage than I can imagine. I had fun in high school, much to the chagrin of my parents. I had fun in college. I don't think I was the first person chosen for my medical school class. Uh, 
after, after the first two years of medical school, which were just boring, as they were just a continuation of classwork, uh, I, when I got into, cl into clinical medicine, that wouldn't work anymore. I have yeah, put a lot of time, but I mean, just so much fun. And the rest of my career has been fun like that. Highlights? Oh, when you're elected president of uh, the ISCVS, that's a highlight. Mm -hmm. President of the Central, it's a highlight. You get, uh, you get a surprise party every once in a while, that's a highlight. Uh, but uh, I've been so lucky to participate in things. Uh, I've had an opportunity to be uh, on uh, a RAND committee. Now why? Well, because, well, I think Hugh, Hugh Trout got me on it. I've had the opportunity to, for, to uh, participate in the asymptomatic carotid atherosclerosis study and just happened to be that the neurologist at Loyola uh, trained with, at Wake Forest uh, who was the head of the study and it, I got to be involved with the non-invasive part of the study. Well, Dennis Bandick went back to, uh, not Dennis, uh, uh, Thiel, Brian Thiel went back to Australia. So, you know, they needed you. Yeah, well, they needed it. I, I would just lucked into all sorts of things. And my entire career has been just a, a series of just being in the right place at the right time, and I've been very fortunate. Anything else we should talk about? If I had to impart any, any uh, great words of wisdom to anybody re watching this, first of all, they should have been reading something instead of watching the tape. But after that, just maintain your enthusiasm for whatever you do. If government gets into medicine, they get into medicine. I can't stop that. But make it fun while you're doing it. Make it so it's, a, it's an adventure that you can enjoy. And when Mrs. So-and-so -and -so comes in with a gangrenous, smelly foot, you better figure out how to make it better and, and you'll make an adventure out of it. Just, uh, I think attitude is so, so lacking in some of our younger colleagues. They're, I know that our patients think that we should work 40-hour weeks and we should be very good family people. But when you find those and you say, well, your doctor can't finish your operation, we're bringing the other team because his 40 hours is up, they'll go nuts. You have to be a devoted physician because that's what our patients want. And I, I think we've, we, have to, we have to somehow get our trainees to understand that. And that's... They'll either emulate us or they won't. Well, thank you very much, Bill. It's been a real pleasure talking to you this afternoon. Well, thank you, Walt.